Uh, Vern wanted me to make sure everyone's bladders were empty and balls were fully inflated. Okay? So I don't like lean. That, and that's a problem, you know, because Vern brought me here to speak to you about lean manufacturing, about lean, and about a culture and everything. And that should perplex you because I don't like lean. I love lean. Lean is awesome. I live and breathe it every second. For instance, do you notice the lights are not on up here? Right? They were on the last speaker. I had a hard time seeing the screen. Continuous improvement. I asked if we could turn them down. I moved the table over so I didn't have to walk as far to see my computer. I'm always thinking about how to improve everything to make it better for my customers. And you're my customers. Hopefully that screen's a little brighter now. I love lean because it transforms lives when done correctly. Let me illustrate. The other day, I went to Phoenix, Arizona, and I visited a company called Walters and Wolf that visited our company about two years ago. They're 900 employees, union shop, they're a big construction company, and they put on the curtains on the outside of high rises up and down the west coast. They have offices in San Francisco and San Diego and Los Angeles and and uh, San, San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Seattle. And they learn lean, and they are on fire. Now, this would be the last company in the world you'd ever expect to get lean, because they're a union. You'd think, ah, oh, we're not going to do it. We're not going to improve. You know, the animosity between management and the people doing the work. Just the opposite happened, because they had a fantastic leader named Nick Cosell. And Nick said, we are going to do lean, but Nick did something so different. He made lean his priority in his life. He started implementing lean in the way he did business. And then he taught his management team, his top management team, and then it went down to the entire organization. And when I visited their plant in Phoenix, two years later, I've never been there. This is what happened. Drill bits. I'm going to reverse it so we get it perfect. Everything is lean and lean, Spanish, English, whatever. Okay, <laughs> lean and lean. And then you have all your drill bits very well labeled. And here's uh, my other draw work with the muscles. Third. Wow, excellent. And the, the, the bottom. Wow. Fantastic. The bottom. Here's that for more tools. To get it all more stacked at all. Has it been worth it? My tools more uh, more lean, more fast. Yeah. Uh, finding every tool. Uh. Here we got pink binders. Come on, Joe. Well, well, that was sensitive. We're a sensitive group of guys in yeah, here. Exactly. Um, <laughs> what we did was we decided through a visual color aid that we needed to break up. We have five jobs going at the same time, so each job is assigned a different color. Which then we go out and try to find the actual. Uh, binders to correlate with the color and then we also find the paper to match the binder. So, so everything's color code. So the visual controls, you know this is a particular building and that's a particular building and the correct. red's a particular building. You don't ever have to guess at maybe getting the wrong thing nope. and spend a bunch of time looking nope. around. Nope. Wow. Right. And then you also know if he's working on it by him having his paperwork attached. It's pink so you know that he's working oh, on it. Oh my gosh, well. this is fantastic. Look at that. Great job. I just noticed as I'm walking down here, white binders, and I go, oh, well, look at that, visual controls. This must be another job as opposed to the pink and the green. So I've been here just for 30 seconds in this area. I'm already able to, to get this. They we're eliminating a lot of waste in the fact that our guys on the floor will leave their workstation to come to the lavatory. And when they do that, they what? realize that someone happens to be in there. And, and so now they walking. walk all the way back to their workstation. So now what we did is we created a situation where there's a plunger light inside of the deadbolt lock on the bathroom door. So when someone enters and locks the door, voila. So when the deadbolt engages, it turns the light on and that goes there. So it's idiot proof completely. Idiot proof okay. completely. Okay. Okay. And it's visible throughout three bays of the shop. Okay, <laughs> what do you think of lean? I love lean now. Two years ago, tomorrow, I hated them because I didn't understand it. And the thing I hated the most was two-second improvements. 
Because I could. I yeah, you hated you hated this guy right here, right? Yeah. This guy was, was a nightmare. Now he's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> now today, two two years today, I have so many two second improvements. I'm behind on doing them, and it's a never ending situation. I guess. You're my hero. Everything is lean and lean, Spanish, English, whatever. Okay, lean and lean. <laughs> I love lean because it puts smiles on people's faces because for the first time they're able to validate their ideas and their creativities to solve problems like they've done and their entire culture is on fire. They become a learning organization for other construction companies around the world in just two years. They've made over 3,000 videos and posted them on YouTube. 3,000 improvement videos. It's staggering. And it's so simple, it's unbelievable. And that's what I want to talk about today. What kind of a person are you? Are you someone who's stuck in a rut? Or someone maybe that could learn a few new things? Because I guarantee you, if you're a leader, your people have more creativity and more great ideas than you ever dreamed of. And all you need to do as a leader is figure out how to unlock that potential and let them bloom. That's what I've done in my company. The other day, I had a contractor walk into my office. His name is Matt Stodola. And Matt walked in, and he developed a product for the construction industry. And we've taken that product to market. It is absolutely fantastic. And it's revolutionizing the high-rise industry and the way it works. And I said to Matt, I said, you know, this is crazy. I mean, they're, building, they're using it on all their big job sites. But I said, how come it hasn't? been adopted by more general contractors. And he looked at me and he just said, some people would rather use a rock than a hammer. And I said, wow, that's so true, isn't it? Some people would rather use a rock than a hammer. I quickly went on Google and I said, rock and hammer video. I went on YouTube, rock and hammer video. Couldn't find one. I figured there's somebody's got to be out there beating a nail in with a rock, but I couldn't find one. So being a person, as David said, everything right now, Everything I do is right now. I pulled out my phone and said, Matt, let's shoot a video. I said, let's do it. Here you go. Hey, Matt, what are you doing? Just working. I mean, have you ever thought about maybe like using a hammer? I mean, a what? A hammer. What is it? It'll make your job and your life a lot easier. That rock looks a little maybe like archaic. Hey, it's been working for me up to this point. I'm gonna keep using this. I don't have time. I mean, really, that's what we're talking about, and that's the beauty of lean. Lean allows you to change the paradigm completely and improve everything you're doing. You don't have to use a, ham a rock anymore. Hammers are available, and now there's titanium hammers. Continuous improvement is amazing. So my goal for this quick talk, one hour we're going to be done, is so simple. It's for you to see waste like you've never seen it before. I want you to be electrified by it. I want you to go, oh my gosh, I had no idea there was so much waste. It is swirling around every one of you like a tornado. And all lean is is the ability to see waste and eliminate it through continuous improvement. It's so simple. But people make it so complicated and so inaccessible. I like to illustrate by telling you a story and showing you a quick video. If I asked you how long it would take you to change the tire on your car, how long would it take you? Give me some numbers. 10 minutes, you're fast. Half hour? 45 minutes, some people say 45 minutes, a half hour to get the crap out of the back of my trunk, and then 15 minutes to change the tire, right? Other people, a half hour, I got to call AAA, right? There's no better way to illustrate what lean is all about than looking at a bad tire change, a clunky process. Because lean makes great processes out of everything. They make processes that are easy to execute by everyone. But a bad process is a nightmare. So watch this bad tire change.
Now, the customer is that guy in the front seat with the white helmet on. And he wants to race around the track. And he's like, come on, guys. What's going on here? This guy's standing around, waste of waiting. Yeah, a little more standing. Yeah, I'll just hold the tire. That's adding value. Yeah, that's really good. Wow. You know? This is what we do to our customers all the time. It's craziness. Now, let's enter into a lean world. Let me show you what lean looks like. Let me show you operational excellence. Let me show you the world that I live in. In the pit lane, out of everybody. This is Fernando Alonso's stop. Uh, it was actually the fastest single stop. And look at the guys. They look so relaxed. But there he goes. Uh, all four wheels changed and out in 3.3 seconds. Only three seconds. In the now, pit I want lane, you to watch it one more time. Everybody. I want you to this ask yourself, are these guys stop. stressed out? Uh, it was actually They're the very fastest relaxed. Look single at stop. And look, look at the deal. guys. They look so relaxed. Four but tires in three uh, seconds. All four wheels changed. And away you go. And out in 3.3 seconds. That's lean. That's operational excellence. Lean is about producing such a high quality result that it's compelling for your customers to come back over and over again. Lean is the ultimate sales tool. When you're a lean organization, people want to run to you because you get the job done better than anyone else, more efficiently, more thoughtfully. Always with the customer, that's the central focus, customer satisfaction. That race car driver is happy. Now, I know you think I'm crazy that this is the world I live in. Let me give you an illustration. So the other day, we have tours from people come around the world. We have companies with 70,000 employees. Boeing comes to our place. Amazon regularly comes to our place to see us. And we're a little tiny company. We're only 50 employees, 50 people changing the world. So we've got a big company that comes into our place, and they're with Austin in the Laser Jam area, and they're watching Austin, how he's making things, because we do cell manufacturing one at a time. And he goes, man, Austin, I think there's waste there. Now, what do you think we thought as lean thinkers? We said, oh, don't tell us how to do it. I wrote a book about it. Don't tell me how to do it. We've got it all figured out. You can't see waste better than we are. Just the opposite. A lean thinker is totally vulnerable and says, show me where the waste is. Show me where the problem is. I want to improve. So he said, I think Austin is struggling with those latches when he has to open that laser jam case to put the aluminum poles in. And we say, gosh, we never saw that before. You're right. This is what happened. So Austin, show me your great new improvement. In laser jam, to start the case, we have to open it up. We always have to fumble around with this. It's really difficult. Four latches, a little cumbersome. Opens it up, really difficult. So check this out. Wes from the YPO gave me this great idea about how to open the hinges. Very simple. Close the case, really simple. Look at that. All closed, all nice and easy to go. One motion. One motion. Amazing job. Thanks, Wes. Now think about that. What did he take? A couple extra seconds to fumble with those latches but as a lean thinker you start to see waste and you go oh my gosh why should I be struggling with those latches you shouldn't struggle with anything and the minute you struggle is the minute you need to improve and that is the basis for lean when you struggle with something that's the moment the light bulb should go on and you should say how can I improve it that's exactly what happened. The guy said, hey, Wes, Wes, it needs to be better, it's Austin. And Austin said, okay, I think that's right. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But in one morning during our improvement time, Austin solved the problem. And now whenever he goes up there, he doesn't only have the satisfaction of it opening quickly. He has the joy of thinking of the improvement and seeing his life. His work and everything improved dramatically around him because these improvements happen every day at our facility. You cannot work at FastCap until you improve. The first thing we do every day is make an improvement. You cannot work unless you improve, and that means everyone. Now, unfortunately, most companies... When it comes to doing processes, it's like running an obstacle course. It's a nightmare. You know, you would think it, everything you do should be easy, but you're, you're generally going through this because I know it because I travel around the world and I go in these organizations. And when I see the stuff that happens, I go, how do you function at that level? You know, but this is the typical scenario with so many things that goes on in the world in an organization. Dysfunction like I've never seen it before.
It doesn't need to be that way. Because if you're making small improvements every day, you're eliminating this hyper dysfunction. And you're actually changing everything. And it turns out there's something called the rule of a tenth of 1%. And this rule of a tenth of 1% is really amazing. What it says is that if you make the tiniest improvement, one tenth of 1% every day, that you will triple or double your productivity in three years. That is awesome. Now, what happens to an organization like FastCap and the organization like Walters and Wolf? You saw the improvements they're making. They're like doubling their productivity every three months. It's staggering what's going on because they're not doing a tenth of 1%. They're making huge improvements. And this is what can happen to your organization. And the best thing is you have total participation from your people. Isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want our people to be engaged? That's why I love Lean, because it puts a smile on people's face, and it gives you total engagement. This is my Lean team. These are the people that make those improvements every day. So I want to show you a little bit about FastCap, because, you know, you guys are saying, well, what's this guy talking about FastCap? What are I? We're a product development company. I invented one product about 17 years ago called the FastCap, a peel and stick cover cap to cover screw holes. Then I invented the Laser Jam, and now we have like 900 products, and we distribute it in 40 countries, as Vern said, and about 2,700 distributors around the world. And we're having a ball. Life is great, because not only are we good at what we do, we're teaching the world how to build a lean culture. And that, frankly, is the most satisfying work I have ever done in my entire life. So let me give you a little glimpse of our company because it is not normal. Are you ready? Well, hello, everyone. It's time to take a tour of FastCap. FastCap is located in Bellingham, Washington, just about two hours north of Seattle, up in a little tiny town called Ferndale, right on I-5. It's a beautiful place. We have about a 50,000 square foot facility. It's just really, really cool place to work. About 110 windows, lots of natural light everywhere coming in. We're going to take you inside. Now remember, it's simple. It's not fancy. So when you get inside, just a big overview. We got three big ass fans keeping everything cool and lots of natural light everywhere. When you walk in the front door, it's all stand up. We made all the desks out of our fast pipe system. Everything simple. Now, people always say, well, do people like to stand up? We wouldn't have it any other way. Is it difficult to stand up? Sure, it takes a little time to get used to it, but we love it. Everything's on wheels. Everything's flexible, including the filing cabinet. Conference room, very simple. Stand up, no chairs. The meetings don't last very long. Our graphic design area, again, everything's stand up. Everything's on wheels. Everything's flexible. We want to be flexible because our needs are always changing. All our tools are carefully shadowed. We never search for anything. We never struggle. Because the minute you struggle, you have waste. Our main production line, everything flowing towards the shipping terminals. You'll see how that works here in just a minute. It's very cool. See, that's an aisle where the product is made, flows down to the area where we package it. People are in the cells. They pick, package, and ship. Everything two hours, fax to truck. It's pretty amazing. So this is our shadow board of all the products that we make. So we do lateral thinking. We walk up, we look at it and say, hey, we've made a part like that before. This is our CNC area where we make all of our molds. All of our toolboxes are carefully shadowed out with our Kaizen foam system. It makes all the difference in the world when you take the time to make this happen. Now, the way this looks like this is every day we make an improvement. These are our injection molding machines, they're Sumitomos, they're really high tech, they're very cool, they have robots on them to remove the parts. All the tools again are shattered out for the Sumitomos. These are all of our injection molds down below with the parts actually magnetically attached to them. These are all the colorants and materials that we use with Kanban cards. And the way we accomplish all this is so simple. We sweep, sort, and standardize everything in the morning when we come in. Everyone makes one improvement. We have a morning meeting. We build a culture and then we work. And I am fully engaged in the process. The leader has to be engaged. You got to keep things simple and you make it fun. The rest is history. Nice. Never forget, lean is simple and fun. So our kata, our routine, our habit, which we've heard a lot about, is we walk in at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we do something called 3S, not 5S. 5S is the typical nomenclature in the lean world. We do 3S. We sweep. We polish our entire factory. It is spotless. We sort, we get rid of all the crap out of our work areas because it doesn't belong there. 
And then we create clear standards and processes on how we perform the work every day. And in the process of sweeping and sorting and standardizing, we find things that bug us, find things that are out of order. We put them in order. We make an improvement because everyone has to make one tiny two-second improvement. Then we meet as a company for a half hour to 45 minutes, and we go to FASCAP University, and we study the Constitution, we study history, everyone walks forward with their gratefuls, we look at our sales numbers, we make sure every department is on time, we have a dashboard so we know the pulse of everything. Everything is produced, sh packaged, and shipped two hours, fax to truck. Unheard of. And yet we take the first hour and a half, sometimes hour and 45 minutes. We have never missed for seven years. We build a culture. We value our people. We say the most important thing we do is build our people. If you don't have strong people, you can't have a strong company. Well, we don't have strong people. We have incredible people that run circles around everyone else. That's why everyone comes to visit us. So what was my goal for you? Anyone remember? To see waste. I want you to see waste like you've never seen it before because if you do, when you walk out of here one hour from now, and you see waste, and all of a sudden a light bulb goes on. You only have to do one thing, see that waste. You will never be the same. Because we have companies around the globe, whether it be Tatra Bank with 70,000 employees who are going to be in our company on Monday with the president, CEO, and chairman of the board for the third time, whether it be Amazon, whether it be Boeing, whether it be Bombardier, whether it be Coca-Cola, it doesn't matter. We see and hear from all of them. They're all doing this, and they're having outrageous results. Why? Because we kept it simple. You make it complicated, no one's going to get it. We're all busy. We all have so much we have to do, and then you want to throw on this whole other thing you have to do. Just sweep, sort, and standardize. Make a small improvement. Meet as a team. Doesn't a football team meet? on every down? Why shouldn't you meet on every down? Why shouldn't you meet at least once a day? Could you imagine them running a football play and not meeting? It would be a disaster. What's the difference from what we do? It's the same thing. Everything is a process. Everything you do, how you invoice, how you answer the phone, how you manufacture widgets, how you produce legal documents, how you manage spreadsheets, how you clean your bathroom. Everything is a process. And everything has tons and mountains of waste inside the two walls of the start and end of the, that process. And your job as a thinking, rational human being is to identify the waste and shrink it down and eliminate it and add more value to your customers and deliver an amazing culture to the people who you're responsible for. Amen. So, am I sounding like a preacher, Vern? Is I that love it? it. I love it. So here you go. Everything's a process. So you got a billion-dollar company like Delta, and they gave me this airline ticket, and as a lean thinker, I looked at that dyslexic, and my eyes aren't very good, and I'm going, holy mackerel, that is a nightmare. <laughs> is that not a nightmare? Look at that. Different fonts, everything overlapping, there's no rhyme or reason to it. That's a billion dollar company. Now, we are not a billion dollar company, but we are lean thinkers. So I took my iPhone out, real time, as David said, real time, put it on my leg like that, took a picture, sent it to my graphic design department. 15 minutes later, they came back with the lean rendition of a lean airline ticket. Now, remember, it was a 20-year-old and a 25-year-old working for a multi-million dollar company, not a billion dollar company. And they did it in 15 minutes. Okay, let's take a look. Cool. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Everything is a process. Everything. And you got to get your head around that. Because if you start making excuses that you don't, you're not a manufacturer, you don't make stuff, you're missing it completely. 
everything is a process. Now, we had Toyota. I didn't mention that Toyota's been to our place, have I? No, and we just had the president of Toyota China in our place last week. Kind of forgot about that. It's crazy. What, what are these people coming to our place for? Toyota walked in and looked at this when I showed it to them. They said, that is fantastic. Now, I want you to look at that. Notice we have it all in sequence. The font's been standardized. We have graphical uh, displays, everything visual control, where we're going, what gate you need to be at, what time it's boarding, where you seat. No stress anymore of that. You know you're in the front of the plane, back of the plane, aisle, window. It's all clear. And what time you take off. I mean, anybody can get that. They should standardize this for all airlines from here on out. Could you imagine how simple that would be for all of us? But Toyota looks at that, and thank you. Toyota looks at that, thank you to my 20 and 25-year-old graphic designer. Toyota looks at that, and they say, that is really good, but it can be improved. So what do you think I said? I got defensive, hey, you came to me to learn lean, even though I learned it from Toyota. I didn't say that. I said, what? How? When? And they said, I think that you need an arrow showing the direction you're flying. And I want to know when I arrive so the person picking me up can be there on time. I don't want to have to search for that information. I said, you are so right. Look at that. We put a little arrow. We put the date up there, and we put the arrival time. So simple, continuous improvement. Two-second lean. Small, tiny, incremental improvements every day before you work. That's it. It's so simple. It's so simple. And the net result is an amazing airline ticket that was produced by a 20 and 25 year old. Now, the way we manage and understand whether or not you've really made an improvement, because a lot of you are thinking right now, well, Paul, how do I know whether or not it's really an improvement? Well, it's very simple. We have a very simple criteria for that, and it's called safety, quality, simplicity, and speed. Those are the criteria that we want to meet, and those are the order we want to meet them in. So we would never make an improvement if it impairs safety. So let's look at that airline ticket real quick. Was it safer? Did, did, it, did it have anything to do with safety, that improvement? Not really. Maybe less heart attacks because you didn't miss a plane, but it really isn't a safety thing. Is the airline ticket a better quality? The, the, the purpose of the ticket is to give you information, right? Did it produce a better quality product for the person it was being given to? Yes, right? So no safety issue. That's neutral. Quality, it was definitely better. The next thing is, was it simpler? Simplicity, absolutely it was simpler. If we make an improvement, we add complexity, a root gold burr, I mean, we don't want to do that. And a lot of times people like to add all this complex processing. You shouldn't do that. That's not what lean's about. It's about stripping away the superfluous things and getting to the root of the issue. And then the last thing, speed. Was it faster? It was way faster to get the information. So it met three of the criteria, hands down. Hands down it met them. And that's the way we measure every improvement. So we don't get in fights on whether or not it's Bob's idea or Jane's idea or Paul's idea or Leanne's idea. That, that's not even in our, 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 our world. We don't even talk like that. It's only whether or not we deliver more value to the customer based on the criteria of safety, quality, simplicity, and speed. Now, the funny thing about that is all of you are looking at me saying, I thought Lean was all about going faster, faster, faster. It is not. Lean is about delivering more quality. Who doesn't want more quality? When you think of Japan, and I say the word Toyota, Honda, Kubota, Panasonic, Sony, what do you think? Say it for me. Quality, right? Lean is about quality. And if you make a quality product, it's inevitably going to be simpler and faster. It's just the way it works. And if you don't think I'm, I'm crazy on that, you have to enter into the lean world and you'll see it happen because it's magic what happens when you apply your lean filter to things. So here's a little example, and we'll do a little test here on whether or not this meets the criteria. You ready? Lean truck. Pretty clever if you ask me, right? 
So let's go over it. Safety, maybe not the safest thing in the world. You know, I'm not going to go tell my people to do that. I mean, you could do it, but I'm not going to tell my people to do it. So it really doesn't meet the safety criteria, so it's really not the direction I'm probably going to go at this point. It's possible, not great. Quality, is there, does it affect the quality of the product? It might damage it, it might not. I don't know, we'd have to look at that. And then sim simplicity, oh, definitely it's way simpler than hand unloading that. I mean, come on, that's quite effective, right? And speed, it's, it's faster. But it, but it jeopardizes potentially the safety issue, so we're really not going to go that direction. That's the way we look at improvements. It's just that simple. My operators drive forklifts, very heavy machines, 40,000-pound machines around our facility, and they would say to me, they don't say this because they're smarter than that and they know that, but typically an operator would say, well, the thing goes way faster. I can drive really fast and we're going to save time. What do you think my response is? No. Safety is number one. If we injure someone, that's a catastrophe. We want you to go at a very calm, moderate pace where you can easily stop in time if anything weird happens. I'm willing to pay for that. I'm willing to pay for my people to have a quality experience in our facility where they're not threatened by a 40,000 pound machine that's coming at them at 15 miles an hour. That's just not the way we do business. That's our criteria. Everywhere I go, I see waste. It's staggering. So I went to uh, Boston the other day, and it was actually in Rhode Island, and I went to McDonald's. I love McDonald's coffee, a buck. It's a great, great deal. And this is what happened. So here is my scene waste for the day. I just got my Newman's coffee for a buck at McDonald's. I love the value of McDonald's. But I asked for three creams and two Splendas in the coffee, and they said, no problem, we'll put it in. But she handed me this bag. And I go, wow, that bag's heavy. And she put five creamers, four Splendas, and four sugars. I think that's a little bit of overproduction and a whole lot of waste. Now that's happening millions of times around the world at McDonald's. Think about that. You've had it all happen to you. We're throwing all that stuff in the landfill. For what reason? Because the person who executed that process was improperly trained, was not trained to listen carefully to exactly what the customer wanted, because I was very clear what I wanted. And instead, we have all that overproduction. And then we have to transport that. And then we put an inventory in the garbage can. These are the eight wastes right now. I'm doing them right now in front of you. And the next thing you know, we got a defect because that stuff's rotting in the trash can. And then we got to overprocess it. We got to haul it on a dumpster, to haul it with a truck to the landfill. And then we got to take a D8, D9 and turn it over for the next 40 years and manage the methane right? And that's excess motion, all the stuff that goes into that. Meanwhile, the customers are waiting, right? Because we're doing all this stupid work carrying garbage out to the trash that we shouldn't need to carry out to the trash because we've overproduced and we've wasted our employee genius because we're not having our people think about where the waste is and how we can add more value and keep our prices under control and deliver more quality to our customers. It's that simple. This happens everywhere. But yet, occasionally, you have a magical process. I went to the next day to the uh, Las Vegas McDonald's, and I saw something totally different. Non-standardized work. One McDonald's was doing it one way, the other McDonald's was doing it the other way. Now watch this, because this is magic. This is lean. Watch this. Same thing. Put Splenda in, same time, milk's going out, reach it for the coffee, milk's done, not even a wasted second, boom, goes in. Ten seconds later, the coffee's perfect. That's all the first person had to do. They have the same machine there, right? The same machine, but they didn't do it. Non-standardized work. That's why in the lean world, it's very important that we create standard processes for the way we do things. Because once you have a standard, it's only once you have a standard that you have the ability to measure whether or not you're really making an improvement. If you have no standard, then it's just a free-for-all. I think it's better this way, and Jane thinks it's better this way, and Bob thinks it's better this way. But we create clear standards. We train our people intensely. People say, how do you orientate your, your people when they come to work for you? Are you kidding? We're orientating them every day. We're training them every day. Every day, we watch lean videos. Every day, we watch the process improvements. Every day, we review six of the improvements that people make in our facility. It's like crazy. It's magic. We're reinforcing the belief that people are smart. We're reinforcing the importance of training and creating standardized work so we have evenness in our company. 
We don't work in the emergency room. The emergency room is a nightmare. It costs 10 times more to operate in crisis mode. All that variation is just destroying your company. We don't do that. We have great processes because we're constantly refining them so we can operate evenly, smoothly, getting rid of the variation. You know, I just had a, a company from Portugal at my place the last couple days, and the guy's been doing two-second lean for only four months or so, and he's just doing incredible, a granite manufacturer. And he said something I never heard anybody ever say before. He said, waste is like punching you in the face. Constantly just boom, boom, boom. You're just getting pummeled by it. You're getting pummeled by all that variation. Your company's just throwing out hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars, just wasting it everywhere. You're just getting pummeled by it. He said, but when I became a lean thinker, I, for, for the first time I had the ability to fight back. And now I'm fighting back. I see the waste coming. I'm blocking it. I'm taking a jab. I'm getting rid of it. I said, that is such a powerful analogy, Philippe. That is exactly what happens. So many of us are just being pummeled by waste, and we have no clue it's happening all around us. And the reason why is because we can't see it. I'll illustrate with this video. Pay very close attention to the directions. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did How you count? How many times? 15. 16? Close. The correct answer is 15 Good job. Passes. Very alert, you guys. But did you see the gorilla? Yeah. I didn't see it when I first saw the video. It's just exactly what's going on with waste. It's happening all around you. You don't even see it. So where are we going? It's very simple. Hopefully I've illustrated in the first part of this talk that lean is simple. It's not that hard and that everything is a process. Take that and remember that. Everything is a process. I'm going to tell you about my lean journey, how I got started in lean and why I'm such a fanatic about it. And we're going to learn to see waste. That's it. It's that simple. So who am I? I'm not a consultant. I don't do this for pay. I'm not a professional speaker, although I speak all over the world. I am a manufacturer. I like to get my hands dirty. But most importantly, I'm a lean fanatic. Bascap is first a lean company. And then, through happenstance, we're a woodworking product development company. Did you get what I just said? We are first a lean company because it doesn't matter, as Jim Collins said, it doesn't matter what FastCap is doing, we will be wildly successful because we have the fundamentals right. And we never forget that and we never compromise that doesn't matter how busy we get. Most people say, I'm too busy. You think you're busy, man. We are slammed. We have orders coming from around the world and dealing with all the complexity of, of orders from around the world. But we never say, we're too busy today, we're not going to do our morning meeting. We're too busy today, we're not going to improve. That is not even something we would ever negotiate because we know we are where we are because of what Lean has done for us. So 15 years ago, this is my story. We were doing amazing. We were doing really well. People, the most common question people ask me is, when's your company going to go public because I want to invest in it? We had one uh, business of the year. You know, we were a small startup product development company. The first product was a peel and stick cover cap, and then we developed a laser jam, and that was wildly successful. And we had an incredible manufacturing facility. I would pilot. The, the floors were painted. Everything was just like buttoned down, labeled. It was perfect. It looked fantastic. Pe the bank would walk in, and they'd look at us, and we went for our first quarter of a million dollar line of credit. And I don't have an MBA. I don't have anything in business. I'm a, I'm a school teacher. Uh, that's my degree. 
And, but he walked in and he said, I've never seen a company this well run in my whole life. I will give you any amount of money you want. You name it, you, want, you get it. I'm going, wow, that, that was a great compliment, right? Because he just saw the discipline in the way we manage our company. There was no burning platform. We were making great money. It was all fabulous. And, of course, it should have looked that way because I wasn't trained by just anybody. That's Bob Taylor there. He's a personal friend of mine. And uh, Bob Taylor trained me. At 17 years old, I went to work for Taylor Guitars. I built the first 2,000 guitars that came out of that plant with Bob and a bunch of other people. And I built all the furniture in my home. And I live in a beautiful green and green home. And I was a master craftsman. And I knew my stuff. I was a school teacher. And, you know, I knew manufacturing. If anybody knew manufacturing, this is it right there. At 23 years old, I was building, you know, huge complexes that were $10 million and 100 units. I was a young guy doing some pretty outrageous stuff. I had a lot of experience. It, it, the bank president should have said that to me. But unfortunately, here's the problem. We were very organized, but the, here is the real issue. Lean is not about being organized. And I know there's a whole bunch of people out there right now that you're thinking to yourself, I'm already really organized. I must be lean. I'm already doing lean. You have no clue what lean is. I had no clue what lean is. Lean is not about being organized because you can organize waste, and I was the master of it. I had inventory everywhere. I was overproducing. I had beautiful racks that were all filled up because in my mind, that was the way a company should run. You drive down with a grocery cart. You pick everything off the aisle. You take, you take it, and we produced a whole bunch of stuff. We produced enough product for two or three months, and I was absolutely clueless. I had no idea what just-in-time was. I mean, I was clueless. I had a consultant come in because I was having problems managing my inventory, and, he, and I, I asked him, can you help me? And he said, I don't know if I can help you, man. You're clueless. And I'm going, what do you mean I'm clueless? The bank president just told me I was incredible. He goes, you have no idea what you're doing. I paid attention, and I said, what am I doing wrong? He said, you need to learn something called the Toyota production system or lean manufacturing or Kaizen. Now, that was all Greek to me, and that was a problem because I was Greek, and I didn't understand it, <laughs> right? And I said, how do I learn this? And he said, well, we can hire these young kids, these consultants come in, they're from Japan, and they could probably teach you a thing or two. And I said, okay, well, and he said, but he said, did you know that it wasn't just Toyota that does this Toyota production system, that it was all the top companies in the world, like Harley Davidson was a big lean advocate, and they got into lean in 1980, and that Porsche almost went out of business in 2000, and they hired to Toyota consultants to come in and totally turn the company around. I mean, just a magical story would happen with Porsche, and they're number one in quality now, and the Israeli Defense Forces, no wonder the Israelis kick everyone's butt, right? I mean, these people are unbelievable. I spoke of the Israeli Defense Forces. Unbelievable. Lean fanatics. And Amazon. You know, when you go to Amazon, I love Amazon. I got to tell you, I love Amazon. I love going, oh, da -da -da, click, 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 done. I want to return something. Click, click, done. That's lean. There's, there's a reason why it's that way. Because they understand they want to add value and have a quality experience for the end user. So they've developed their systems around extreme efficiency and a extreme customer focus and centered. They're maniacs about lean. I know, because they come to our place all the time. Virginia Mason, one of the best cancer hospitals in the world, my mother-in-law just died from cancer, but she was treated by them for, you know, five or six years, and she lived much longer than the, they thought she was going to live. And I always went up to her, because I knew this about Virginia Mason, and I didn't tell my mother-in-law this, but I said, what's it like at Virginia Mason? She says, it is the most unbelievable place you've ever seen. They are so on top of every detail. They don't miss a single beat. I go there, they're ready for me, everything's done efficiently. They kept her alive for five or six years. It was really amazing. And it was good because I knew they were a great lean organization. And they learned it from an injection molding manufacturer. That's the incredible thing. These surgeons humbled themselves and went back to an injection molding manufacturer on the East Coast and spent one week there and learned how to do lean manufacturing. And the doctor said, but this doesn't apply. We're, we're, we're putting a pacemaker in. And, and we're hooking up wires, and we're sewing people back up. And Art Burns said, what are you talking about? We're doing the same thing. We take a piece of plastic, we put wires to it, we put it in a package, and we send it home. You do the same thing. You put wires in someone, you put a plastic, you hook it back up, and you send them home. 
It's all a process. And they go, wow, maybe there's something to this. And the rest is history. World class. Best in the world. Many of you probably don't know this story, Southwest Airlines. Now, this is one of the most successful airlines. It is the most successful airlines in world history. There's nobody even close to them. Now, Southwest is an amazing lean organization, and these are the stats. 22-minute plane turns. They don't always do it, but most, com most airlines are lucky if they get the plane out in an hour. I've sat, I've sat and watched Southwest. Literally, the people are queued up. The people, the last person, the last person comes off the plane, and they're, boom, they're going right on. The plane's cleaned and done. Why? The pilot's cleaning the plane. The flight attendant's cleaning the plane. They're all working as a team. Did I tell you that we clean our bathrooms? We don't have janitors. That my wife and I clean our bathrooms? We all work as a team. Nobody's better than anyone else. We all work together as a team. They're always profitable. They never lost money. They have personal freedom. They're, they're destined to make $1 billion in profit. The highest paid airline employees in the world, 11 million passengers a month. They fly more people than any other airline in the world, even though they're not bigger. They're not the biggest. And they have fun. That's why I love Lean. It's amazing. You produce results like this and just go, wow, I want to be a part of operational excellence. And then they got so smart, they said, we're only going to fly one plane, the 737. All the other airlines, they are so clueless. Look at this right here. So this is a typical airline. I was in Russia four or five weeks ago, and I opened up the book when I was on this airline. I said, God, I'm a pilot. I'm an instrument-rated pilot. I understand complexity. Could you imagine what it takes to train all those pilots and train, have a, a different program for every one of those planes? Because you can't just let anybody fly a plane. You've got to be checked out in every plane. That means that flight attendants have to be checked out in planes. That means the mechanics. That means all the manuals, all the spare parts. The complexity just goes like this. But Southwest said, no, 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 we're going to fly just one plane. Everybody said, you can't do that. That's not the way it's done. Southwest said, no, 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 we're going to do standardization. We're going to simplify everything. We're going to keep it really simple, and we're just going to fly one plane. And we're going to make more money than the rest of you, and we're going to have more fun, and we're going to have more customer satisfaction. Ah, oh, the power of standardization. It is awesome. So we hired these couple kids to come into our facility, and I thought they would come in and tweak a great company because we had no learning platform. We were rock and roll good. Everything was doing great. But instead, they came into my place, and they transformed everything into U-shaped cells. And all, the next thing you know, we were making one at a time. And I was going, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And they told me I only had to make one at a time. And I said, you can't do that. And they said, oh, yes, you can do that, and you have to do it. It was taking us 45 minutes to set up our machines. And they went in, and they said, watch this. And in one week, they took our processes from 45 minutes to five minutes. That's not like a 10% improvement. That's not like a 20%. That's not doubling productivity. I mean, that's blowing it out of the water. So we went from 45 minutes to set up a machine to five minutes. All of a sudden, we didn't have to overproduce. Now we could do everything just in time. So when a customer ordered white fast caps, almond fast caps, hard rock maple fast caps, we produced just what the customer wanted when they wanted it. We didn't put a bunch of stuff up on the shelf and then have to manage it, count it, dust it off, and do everything else amazing. I'm going, guess what? I'm clueless. That's what I was thinking. I have no idea what I'm doing. Then they went into the laser jam area, and the same thing it was taking us 45 minutes to build a laser jam. We built 100 at a time, and they got it down to seven minutes in one week. And at that point, I was like, forget it. I got to learn this. I didn't realize how far off base I was. So the next thing you know, I was on a plane to Japan. Three months later, I was sitting in front of Japanese companies like Toyota, and I was seeing things I never saw before. I saw people at stand-up desks, open communication, no walls. I go, wow, this is totally different than what I'm used to. And then I went into manufacturing plants that were absolutely spotless. They looked like Disneyland. Look at this place. It's got light coming, natural light coming in, murals everywhere. It's just spotless, and it was so easy, and everything was just in time. They had so much time in this plant that every week they went around and cleaned one square block. They cleaned the community around them because this is so much about what a lean company is about. It's about giving back. I mean, we have so much joy from teaching people around the world what we're doing. Imagine what our people feel like when they know we are literally changing the world. It's pretty incredible. So we saw some amazing things. This is Lexus at the bottom, excuse me here, and uh, that's a yellow smokestack, and they did that because of visual controls. They wanted to show the employees and the community whether or not they're polluting visual controls on all that. The, the top picture, the green floor, that's Toto. That's a toilet manufacturer. If you've ever been in a toilet manufacturer or a brass casting manufacturer, it's the dirtiest business you've ever seen. It was the cleanest plant, cleaner than my plant, I've ever been in in my life. 
there was no chance of any defect. If there was one thing not working, it was so obvious. I went into another plant. Everything was on wheels, including the Coke machine. Everything was flexible. If they needed to clean around the Coke machines, they just rolled them out of the way. They didn't build anything in because the minute you build something in, you lose flexibility. Lean is about delivering to your customer what your customer wants when they want it, not about you building a Taj Mahal to yourself. This is the president of Toto. He has a badge that says zero. It means zero mistakes, zero machine downtime, zero injuries. They weren't interested in like Six Sigma. It was perfection they were after. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. And I just kept seeing these example after example, and I said, I am so far off. Life could be so much better. I could deliver so much more value for my customers and my people. I've got to learn this stuff. So our next stop was Hawks, amazing company. This is a company that just astounded me, to say the very least. So when we were there, that's the president in the, mi in the middle there, Mr. Minabi, and uh, when we greeted him on the bus, when he got us off the bus, we were in our suits and everything, he immediately got us down on our hands and knees and made us scrub the floor with his people. And I go, wow. This is a very big company, very sophisticated electronics manufacturer. And I didn't like it. I was pissed that he got me down on my hands and knees. I said, why are you doing this? I mean, we got floor cleaners to do this. What is this all about? He was trying to teach me humility. And I didn't get it. And finally, by the end of the day, I realized what this man was doing. He had lowered himself. He was on the same level as his people. He met with his people every day. Every day he cleaned his factory floor with his people. His people loved him. The productivity was through the ceiling. It was the most incredible place I'd ever visited. He 3 s everything. He taught me the power of 3 s not 5 s I asked him, why not 5 s He says, why do you need to 5 s We're automatically sustaining it, and we're automatically self-disciplined because we do this every day. Oh, I love simplicity. He made it so simple. I don't have to remember 5 now. I only have to remember 3. And he taught me the power of this. And I tell you, you know, if you want to look at 3 se nightmares, just go look at your computer screens, go look at the way you organize your files, look at your desk drawers. It's, I know what it's like, you guys. I've been there. Girls, guys, I've, I've been there. I've seen it, man. This is my desk. You ready? This is my laptop. Check it out. So this is, uh, here we go. I went the wrong way there, so there you go, right there. This is my desk. I don't have an office. There's no thing that says Paul Akers, president. You don't have to knock on the door and say, King Paul, can I have a meeting with you? I'm always on the shop floor. I'm always everywhere working with my people because the value is added on the shop floor. Everything's standardized. You open our drawers. All the front of all of our drawers are all standardized. So it doesn't matter whose desk I go to, I open it up. The scissors are always there. The tape's always there. The sticky notes are always there. And then in the back of the desk, we have everything organized according to what's specialized for the particular person. We created a clear standard so you can be flexible. Anybody can walk up to my desk and work in a split second. I can walk up to somebody else's and work. There aren't all these specialty things. Remember Southwest Airlines? There aren't all these specialty planes to get all over the place. It's pretty incredible. So we teach 3Sing to people around the world. And the cool thing about this whole concept of lean, and particularly two-second lean, is kids love it. Kids are naturally creative. And this is William in the UK. He's telling us a little bit about 3 s -ing. Hi. Hi, William. Hi. What have you been doing today? I've been doing 3 s -ing. You've been doing what? 3 s -ing. 3 s -ing. What does that mean? That means I've sorted it all out. Yeah? Let's have a look then. Let's have a look inside. Wow. So tell me again, what have you done? Three S M. Look at me. What have you done? Three S M. And what does that mean? That means I've sorted it all out. And do you know what the three S's are? Three S M. Yeah, but do you know what they stand for? Nope. <laughs> Sweet, sort, and standardize. Yeah. Tell me. Sweet, sort, and standardize. <laughs> Good boy. Isn't he awesome? Yeah, it's just awesome. It doesn't matter where you go, it puts smiles on people's faces because it just all makes so much sense. It's so much common sense. And when we went around Hawks, we just saw clear standards on everything they did. It was just so obvious. And when I asked the president of Hawks, you know, what happens when you have big manufacturers like Nissan come here and Ford? Because everybody was coming to his plant to see what they were doing, just like people started coming to our plant after we started implementing this simple version. And he said, oh, Paul, you know, smart people can't believe it can be this simple. 
We have to complicate everything. We have degrees. We have PhDs. We have masters. We're engineers. We have to make everything complicated because that's what gives us value. And I said, thank you. Finally, somebody speaks the truth. I said, I get it. What is lean? Learning to see waste and eliminating waste by fixing what bugs you. It's that simple. It's amazing how simple it is. We came back and we started teaching our people the eight deadly sins of waste. We taught it with a fast food analogy. So if you go into a hamburger joint and they make too many hamburgers, so the first thing they do is they overproduce. That's number one, right? You don't have to remember an acronym. You just remember that all waste starts with overproduction. The minute you make too many of something, you're going to start the waste cycle. So they produce too many hamburgers, and then they got to transport them, and they put them in inventory in the warming oven. So the first thing was overproduction. Then we transport them, and they go into the warming oven. Then the customer walks up and says, I want a hamburger with no ketchup and no pickles. Oh, no, we got a defect. So we've got all this inventory with a defect. So now we've got to take it down, open it up, overprocess it, waste motion. Meanwhile, the customer's waiting, and we're wasting our employee potential. It's the eight waste fast food style. It's that simple. We started teaching the eight waste to people around the world and to our team by a simple story. So we know that whenever we overproduce, just like those two young kids taught us, when we overproduced our product, then we put it on the shelf, then we had to manage it, put it in inventory, dust it off. The customer wants a different size, different shape, different color. Then we got to, oh gosh, then we got to take it down, repackage it, different configuration, whatever it is. That's the eight ways. It's that simple. And they're happening everywhere around you nonstop. It's a gigantic game to find it and eliminate it. That's what we've turned it into. I came back from Japan, and I made my first video. I pulled out my iPhone, and I saw waste, and I said, i got to capture this. And this is when it all started, the power of using your phone right here in front of you. When David said, this is the most powerful tool, David, amen, this is it right here. Literally, you can change the world with this little thing. This is my first cheesy, lean video. In an attempt to always find waste, this is my burrito that I'm eating. Now they asked me when I bought it if I wanted sour cream and hot sauce. And I said yes. So instead of putting it in the burrito, they gave it to me in a separate container. I have an idea. Next time, put the sour cream and the hot sauce in the burrito. Okay, I just finished my burrito and this is all the waste. We have the aluminum foil that's going to be thrown out, the paper that's going to be thrown out, the container from the salsa and the sour cream. We have two napkins, one I didn't use, and a whole little box here with a plastic fork and a plastic knife, all going to be put in the landfill for one burrito. All I really needed was the aluminum foil to wrap it in, and that was it. Sour cream, everything could have been inside. In one napkin, I would have made less of a mess, and I would have been perfect. Look at all the waste. Check out this waste. We did a spreadsheet. Four cents for the carton. The knife and fork, six cents. Everything added up to 31 cents of waste per burrito. 30 burritos a day, $9.30 times seven days a week, 52 weeks. $3,385 per store. If you take 31 cents a burrito times 10 million burritos a day in the U.S. alone, that's $3.1 million in the landfill. That's total waste. Okay, I'm back to the local coffee shop, curb shops, and we're gonna get ourselves a lean burrito. Watch how this is done. Hi, Gina, how are you? Good, how are you? Can I get a lean burrito? Sure. I want a burrito with sour cream, hot sauce inside, Aluminum foil and nothing else in one napkin. Sounds good. Okay, okay. thanks, Gina. Here it comes, the lean burrito. What do we got? Aluminum foil, one napkin. Wow, that's amazing. Look at all the waste we eliminated with the sour cream and everything inside. Isn't this yummy? Look at this thing. All ready to go, just the way I wanted it, just what the customer wanted, and no more and no less. Pretty crazy, isn't it? everywhere in your organization. I spoke in Washington, D.C. about three years ago, and when they introduced me, it was at a lean consortium, and the guy who was put on the conference, like Vern, was an expert in the field of lean, and he asked me to come in, and I said, yeah, you know, Jeff, I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm not gonna, sh I'm not gonna talk about value stream mapping. I'm not gonna talk about all the, the, the typical things lean people talk about. He goes, that's okay, because I know what you're gonna talk about. 
And when I got up, just as Vern introduced me, he gave me an amazing introduction. He said, you know, I could tell you Paul's, uh, a bunch of accolades about Paul, but all I want to tell you is he made a, a movie or a video called The Lean Burrito, and I watched it, and I've never been the same. And this, is, and this is what's happened, and this is his story that I had him retell after he introduced me. Hi, my name is Jeff Fuchs, and I just wanted to describe a little bit about what happened after I watched the Lean Burrito video. So I'm walking into my favorite place, Starbucks, and I order a drink, and it suddenly dawns on me that there's a lot of waste going on here. I'm getting a paper cup, a paper sleeve, the plastic top, and then I have to tell people what my order is, and they put my name down on the cup. They're wasting a lot of time. They're writing down all my specifics, and it could be a lot less confusing for everybody. So I went in, I bought one of their steel cups, I broke out my label maker, and I put all my information right on it. There's my name, there's all my specifics, 4SL in their code. It's simple, it's hassle-free, it's better for them, it's better for me. And these days, I walk into Starbucks and I'm a rock star. <laughs> Right, and he gets it, and he goes, man, this is crazy. I would have never even seen all that waste. I would have never seen the fact that I had to repeat all this stuff over and over again, day after day, and they had to write it down. That's all waste. That's all over processing. That's all not necessary. He created a clear standard, a standard process that people could execute easily every day. So now his mind is freed up to do other high-level work. But we use this powerful brain to do some of the stupidest things you've ever seen. So the ground rules are so simple. Lean is simple and lean is fun. You keep it lean, you keep it that way, you're going to do great. We had a professional study done by Harvard. They spent about five years and five million dollars to, to answer the question, why students learn. Are you ready? It was so simple. Number one, show up to class. Number two, sit in the front row. So, my A students, raise your hand. My B students, my C students, D and table 37 back there, wave your hand. My F students are back there in the back, right? Show up to class and sit in the front row. Five million dollars in five years. Why do people make things so complicated? <laughs> it's as though they love the bureaucracy of lean. A lot of you have been caught up in that. It's not the world I live in. The world I live in is fun, engaging, and puts smiles on people's faces. It's absolutely awesome. You know, everywhere I go, though, I see some crazy stuff. So I was at Disneyland the other day, and I call this Fruit Loops Lean. Watch how bad. Remember that obstacle course? Remember that bad tire change? Watch what people are tortured with every day in this hotel by Disneyland. The name of this video is Fruit Loops. And the other day, my wife and I and my family were down at Disneyland staying at the Candy Canyon. And we made an observation that was almost comical if it wasn't absurd. And what happened was, the hotel that we were staying at had this Fruit Loops dispenser. And whenever anybody went up to get their Fruit Loops, they began to struggle. And what was interesting about this is the employees for the hotel, they were all watching and saw everything that was going on, and nobody has ever tried to fix the Fruit Loop dispenser, in spite of the fact that everybody struggles with it. It's almost comical, but it really typifies the idea that employees are really not empowered to solve problems. And when they don't solve problems, the customers suffer. Young and old, everyone suffers. So I shot this video just to kind of show you what really the current state is in most workplaces. People come to work, they do their job, but they rarely improve. And as a result, the customer suffers and enormous time is wasted. Think about how long it should take to actually get a bowl of Fruit Loops. And yet, this young guy here, he is struggling big time to get the simplest thing. Look at this. And of course, remind you, while this is going on, there are two or three employees that are within clear view of all this, seeing it happen, and haven't said to their boss, or their manager, you know, really, we got to fix this Fruit Loop thing. But instead, everybody suffers. It just goes one person after another. There you go.
go. And there's some. A little more. A little more. A little more. Oh! Overflow. <laughs> All over the floor. And look at the mess. And now imagine this hotel has been doing this for year after year, day after day, with nobody saying, hey, we can do better. Empowered people or paralyzed people? Are your people totally empowered? Have you spent time teaching and training them to see the eight ways? Have you taught them how to think about continuous improvement? Or are they paralyzed? All we did was come back from Japan and started teaching and training our people. I was at the Lexus plant, and we had just toured it, and the vice president had given us the tour and did a lecture. And I asked him, I said, what is the number one thing for Toyota? And he says, it's not the ex engineering feat. It's not the next hybrid. It's not the next factory we're going to open up somewhere in the world. It's not the next sales plan. He said all Toyota cares about is teaching and training its people and building a culture of continuous improvement. And I said, oh, I get it now. I haven't been teaching and training. I want people to do lean, but I've spent no time. I put no investment into teaching and training them. I came back with the information from Hawks, and we started 3Sing our facility. We started meeting as a team every morning. We began teaching and training our people, and then we went to work. And within one year, we had people from around the world touring our facility. It was terribly difficult. The first three months were hell. Everybody looked at me like I was crazy. After six months, things were going a little bit better. After nine months, I'm going, I think I made the right decision. After one year, people started touring our facility going, I've heard about what's going on in your company. This is crazy. And the rest is history. Teaching and training your people and building a culture of continuous improvement and then work. We use our wits, not our wallet. We don't spend money like drunken sailors, although we have plenty of money to spend, but we're very creative how we solve problems, and there's no better way than to look at this. You know, men's bathrooms have had a problem for years. You know, we're not the cleanest or carefulest people in the world, so they've always been coming up with different styles of toilets to solve the problem to keep us contained a little bit, and they had a contest, and they said that this toilet was like the ultimate toilet, and this was going to solve 95% of the problem. But then this guy from uh, Denmark came up with an idea, and because he's a lean thinker, he said, you know, it's really simple. All we need to do is etch a black horsefly into a urinal and spillage decline by 80%. So you give a man a target, and lean is simple, you know? You <laughs> Using our wits, not our wallet. You know, some of you know who Shigeo Shingo is. Shigeo Shingo, Richio Shingo, was just in my plant about five days ago, his son. Shigeo Shingo is the originator, along with Taichi Ono, of the Toyota production system. And I've got his son standing next to me, mentoring me for three days. I mean, how does a cabinet maker pull that off? I have no idea. And Richio Shingo showed me a picture of his father as he was speaking to our team. And his father has his finger pointed at his head, and he said, Use your brain. Use your brain. Use your wits, not your wallet. This stuff is so simple, it's unbelievable. But we make things so complicated, and all these improvements, where are they? They're right underneath your nose. And if you're Greek like me and you got a big nose, you got more opportunity than most. Okay? We teach big companies, large companies, small companies. You know, it doesn't matter. I was just in San Francisco speaking a couple weeks ago, and I went to a company called Mission Bell, and they are on lean fire. And, you know, they're manufacturers, but we didn't take the improvement from the manufacturing floor. We took one from the office. You ready? This one's killer. Here at Mission Bell, we've made a lean improvement to our application process. It used to be somebody would come into the front desk, and they'd ask for an application. We'd give them this six-page paper copy. They'd fill it out, return it to the front desk, who would walk it up to Jessica, our recruiter, who would then walk over to the scanner, scan the file in so it could save to her computer, and then she'd file this paper file. Now if somebody comes to the front desk, we give them this card. It says, want to work for us? 
Please complete our online application at missionbell.com slash application.html so they can go home or use the public library to fill out the application and send it to us. When we receive the application online, Jessica doesn't have to scan it. Nobody has to walk around. It's all ready to go. This reduces over-processing of Jessica having to take the paper form to the scanner and scan it back to her computer. It reduces defects from possible misspellings or writing that we can't understand on the application because now it's just typed in and we can understand the typed words. Motion of the receptionist having to walk the application to Jessica and Jessica having to walk to the scanner and back. And inventory of the paper copies that used to go in a drawer. We fixed all that with just a little card. Amazing, isn't it? She would have never saw waste, but she learned lean. She learned the importance of identifying waste over processing excess motion. And now she's making improvements everywhere through their entire facility. 250 employees, and they're on lean fire from the shop floor, building architectural woodwork for Google and Apple headquarters, to the office. They all get it. We kept it so simple. See waste and fix what bugs you. You know, there's a, a guy named Rick Warren, and he's uh, quite an interesting guy because Rick wrote a book that has sold more books than all the authors that have ever donned this room. He sold 60 million books. Now, how does someone sell 60 million books? This is like the best-selling book of all time. And the way he did it was he kept it very simple because one of my theses, as you've heard, is that life is really quite simple. People make it very complicated. I don't know why, but they do. And Rick decided that he was going to put the entire concept of his book in the first sentence of the first line in the book. So you don't even need to read the whole book. You just need to read the first line. And the first line says, if you want to have a purpose-driven life, if you want to have a life that is rich and amazing, and you want to have incredible joy in your life, it's not about you. I like that message. That's so much the lean message. It's not about me. It's about the customer. It's about delivering more quality for the customer. It's about me being a servant to my customer. It's about each one of my team members being a servant to one another. It's about us focusing on someone else, but we become so focused on ourselves. And Rick laid it all out and sold 60 million copies. That's the key. If you can develop a humble culture that continually wants to learn and is curious, awesome stuff can happen. If you're willing to say, I'm wrong, you have a better idea, I like your idea better, you're going to love lean. But if you're an egomaniac, you're going to hate this thing. You know, one of the problems we had on our website is you know, we're a pretty diverse company with 900 products. People would say, I don't really get your company. I don't really understand what you guys do. And so I said, well, struggle, opportunity for improvement. It bugs our customers. They're not really clear. So I took out my iPhone, because this is the most important tool you have. And I shot a quick little video, and I put it on our website. I don't know too many websites that do this. When you go to our website for the first time, this is what happens. And if you don't like it, you can blow me up. We put a little bomb. We have a little bit of fun. Watch this. Hi, I'm Paul Akers, and welcome to FastCap's website. What is FastCap? We're a product development company specializing in innovative products for the professional woodworker. Where do we get our ideas? We get them from people just like you. People call me up on the phone, they send me a video, and they show me all their cool innovations. And if we like it, we put it on the market. We develop it, we manufacture it, and we sell it worldwide. We're in 40 countries, 2,700 distributors all over the place. I don't want to hear you anymore. Just blow me up. And then if you really Hi, want I'm to Paul have fun, Akers, and welcome. you can replay me and keep blowing me up over and over again. I mean, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We're not trying to be slick or anything like that. We're just trying to be real. And we have a ball doing it. 
So we had someone watch our tour video, and they said, Paul, you know, your place is incredible. I mean, my, my email box is just full nonstop with emails from people around the world saying, we're doing lean. It's just incredible what you're showing us. We can't believe how simple it is. I mean, I get these emails. I could literally pick up my phone and read them one after another that's come in just today. But one guy said, your place is incredible, but you need to fix something. Here we go. Hey, Paul here. So, you know, people come on a tour here, and one of the things we love to show them is our kitchen table, how we leave everything perfectly clean all the time, and we have our salt and pepper marked out, we have our Windex marked out, we have our paper towels marked out, and people have been watching the videos we've been posting about the tours, and this one guy looks at it and says, Paul, you know, that's really cool, but why don't you use magnets? Then you don't have to worry about kind of realigning the salt and pepper and getting it right over the thing. And I go, you know, that's a great idea. And we're like the magnet kings. We make all kinds of different magnets. So Andre and I undertook this project to put magnets under the Windex, the paper towels, and the salt and pepper shaker. So this is what it looks like. Check this out. You take the salt, boom, it just goes right onto there. But the best thing is, you go over and you try to put the salt on the pepper and it doesn't go on there because we reverse the polarity. You put them on there, look at that. They both just go on perfectly. The same thing with this. That is so cool. Is that incredible? I know, look at this, check this one out. Look at that, it just goes into place. Look at this. Some, one of our people that came on a tour, or somebody watched a tour, is that amazing? That just makes lunch so much more enjoyable. I know, it's fun, isn't it? It looks like, you're gonna, it looks like you're gonna cry. It's <laughs> crazy, isn't it? We take our improvements very seriously here at Fast Cap. It's a big deal to us. So if you want to give us an idea on how we can improve, we would love to know about it. Right, Elena? Wow. Oh, you'll get over it. It's OK. It's just an improvement. We have so much fun. It's just unbelievable. It is the most engaging thing you'll ever do. We have a ball, we're constantly experimenting, we're constantly failing. We fail all the time. 50% of what we do is a failure. But that's how you learn, and you have to be honest with yourself, that's how most of you learn the most important lessons in your life. We allow our people to fail. It's okay to fail. But of course, we train them so intensely that they don't fail as much as most people because they have a really good clue on what it's supposed to look like. I told you that Rich Yoshingo came to our plant, and this is him. This is Shigeo Yoshingo's son, former president of Toyota China. And uh, when I was in Japan about eight or nine weeks ago, uh, he was with us, and it was just incredible to be with this man. And he's so humble for such a high stature. He rose to the highest levels within the Toyota organization. And I asked him a question. I said, what is lean? If I met you on a park bench and I knew nothing about lean and I found out you were the president of Toyota China and then he started Toyota China. He started it. He didn't use the president. He started it. And I said, what is lean? What would you tell me? And this is his answer. And I sit down next to you and I ask you what you do and you tell me I'm an expert in the Toyota production system, huh? and I said to you, what is that? How would you describe that? Oh, no. You know nothing, and I should tell them, tell you. No oh, okay, I should tell you what the TPS is. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> TPS is the accumulation of small ideas of Everybody, it's a, it's a. Love it. It's perfect. Talk. You don't need to say anymore. <laughs> <Talk. laughs> the accumulation of small ideas from, please say it for me, everyone. That's what lean is. You want to make it complicated? Knock yourself out. It's every person everything, every day. I spoke at a MAP conference to an audience a little bit bigger than this, and I got this email right after I left. I read Two Second Lean, and after the benchmarking conference, I am seeing waste in my sleep right now. It is driving me crazy. When I saw Paul speak, I thought it was silly. Now I see the brilliance of his simple idea and lean approach. 
I had everyone read the book. We haven't even had a single meeting on it yet. No morning walk, no daily meeting, yet people are spontaneously making improvements. You can't hold them back. They are realizing they are allowed to make their jobs better. They're just going for it. Once they start to see waste, they can't help but fix it. Nothing like a picture of your people holding up all their improvements. Nobody does it better than Saturday Night Live, and we're going to close with this one. Oh, gosh. Part of continuous improvement, I'm always trying to improve everything I do. I never do the same. I'm always tweaking it. And I spoke at the LCI conference in Dallas, another big group like this, and I got done. I went out in the foyer, and I was sitting there, and some guy walked up to me and said, Paul, that was amazing, but you could make it better. I said, as a lean thinker, what can I do better? He goes, have you seen the Saturday Night Live skit on fixing it? I said, no, I've never seen it. And so I immediately, action this day, I don't waste any time, immediately pulled it up on my phone. I go, oh my gosh, that's hysterical. So here we go. We'll let Saturday Night Live close the talk and summarize everything I'm talking about. Hello, Seth. <laughs> Hello, Amy. Hello, Seth and Amy. <laughs> Oscar, last week the stock market was up nearly 500 points, and this week it's down more than 400 points. Do you see any hints that this roller coaster ride will be ending anytime soon? Very good analogy, Seth. The market is very much like a roller coaster ride, and I do believe it is about to end. But before we get off, we will come to find that our digital camera has fallen out of our shirt pocket, our brand new Ray Bans have flown off our head, and we are about to financially barf on ourselves. <laughs> so, what do, you, what do we do? Well, it's actually very simple. Somebody needs to get on top of this situation and fix it! <laughs> Seth, I haven't slept in two weeks. Somebody needs to look at this mess and fix it. Tomorrow morning, when I have my breakfast cereal, the morning paper better read, it's been fixed! <laughs> fix it! Fix all of it! Now! So what... Uh, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, if you don't mind, Oscar, what exactly should be done? Well, it's not rocket science, Seth. It's a simple three-step process. Step one, fix. <laughs> Step two, it. <laughs> Step three, fix it. <laughs> then repeat steps one through three until it's all fixed. Thank you very much. So, would you guys give Paul Akers a huge, huge hand, Paul?